because of parental duties. So if you could do it, that, that would be highly appreciated. Uh, the reason I'm only mentioning this because of one topic. So if we could squeeze yeah, this into the 5.30 time frame, that would be great. Thanks. Totally. Cool. I think recording's on. Um, and we can go ahead and start. Um, one window. Okay, well, up oh, there it is. Awesome, perfect. Awesome. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. This is the KCP community meeting for October 5th. Um, just a reminder, we are recording. Um, so let's see. Uh, Sergius, maybe you can start off with your comment on the reverse version claims. This is actually a whole presentation with like 12 slides, so, um, or 15 slides even. Um, if that's okay, we can start with that. Oh no, it's not public, and I have to set up the permissions. I will, I will do so as a follow-up. Um, is it okay if I start with the presentation straight off? Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I would like uh, to talk about reverse permission claims. Um, and hello, everybody. My name is Serge, by the way. Who doesn't know me? I'm just a person interested in <laughs> Kubernetes and especially nowadays KCP and currently focusing on authorization subsystem and KCP for the folks who are sort of like new on, on this channel. And I would like to talk about a topic that is called reverse permission claims. I don't know if this is a good term. If it's not, let us know. We'll change everything on the fly. Uh, naming is hard. So what are we talking about? Probably many of you already know the concept of API exports and obviously API bindings. That is, you can um, yeah, have some API, um, some resource schema, which you want to be available in other um, workspaces. And what you usually do as a service provider, you do define a resource that is called an API export to export the thing. In this case, just for the sake of, you know, for anyone who's familiar with the E2E tests, I just called this API export sheriff because, you know, the sheriffs and cowboy API exports appear throughout the whole E2E test, um, you know, stuff. So that should be a little bit for familiar, at least for, for, for the core maintainers. Um, so given an API export that wants to um, export this resource type sheriffs, dot wild, wild west, obviously some, any um, group, um, um, is, is declared in here. What you can do today, wh what you can do already today um, is inside the spec, you can declare so-called permission claims. And what is a permission claim? A permission claim is uh, the intent of the service provider to have access to some other resources next to the one that is being exported. If any one of you knows things like the OAuth flow, whenever you, I don't know, authorize at, I don't know, GitHub, Google, or whatnot, there are usually sometimes questions being asked, like, do you accept um, that your name is being queried or some other, you know, metadata um, about your account um, on behalf of the claimer? And the idea here is sort of like similar, right? So you set a list of resources in the export which you as a service provider would you like to access. Um, the canonical example being, imagine you're a database provider and you're exporting a, I don't know, a database resource which users can then create. You provision a database for them and you claim a secret or secrets inside that API export, uh, which you then, you know, after the database is provisioned, you then just create on your behalf and also uh, you create a secret on the workspace of the user. And thus um, secrets as a resource type is explicitly mentioned here as a claim. What is missing today is sort of like fine grained settings. Today, what you can do is like, you can claim a whole resource all or nothing, um, and nothing else. So we need a little bit of um, more fine grained permissions to set here. And uh, the proposal here is to set uh, verbs on resources that you are claiming. Why is it called ver reverse? I will come to it 
in a minute is because usually when you you know claim a permission to a concrete resource as a service provider you want to have access to it given the example i just mentioned um, a minute uh, earlier um, you want to have access also to secrets in order to provision a secret so you can access the database that is being provisioned by the service provider uh, you also want to restrict the consumer potentially to override that secret right um, you want to have some control over the resources as a service provider that you um, claim but also on the other hand you want to restrict the consumer of the api to mess around with those um, resources so the proposal here is to add two lists of verbs uh, not just one what you usually know from kubernetes when you create role or role bindings um, one is called claimed um, and that declares the list of verbs that a service provider claims um, to have when you know the service provider in this case wants to create delete write um, and so on secrets but restrict the consumer of that api export just to be able to read um, those verbs all right so uh, this is exactly what the proposal here is um, and um, concretely like when it comes to the exact semantics of this list this is an allow list semantics right so exactly like kubernetes where what you know from role or row bindings whatever you have in this set of verbs here um, the user on the one hand whatever is in the claim set the service provider on the other hand in the restrict to by the user is allowed um, to be executed right so and exactly like kubernetes a star means all verbs are allowed a get um, in this case is just only get is allowed obviously the verbs are uh, arbitrary and if it's empty list it's no verbs are allowed note this deviates a little bit from kubernetes you cannot have an empty list of verbs in role by or in role definitions or cluster role definitions um, in this case we are allowing it because we don't have a separate resource type for declaring those verbs so tldr being claimed is the set of verbs what is the service provider allowed to do and restrict to what are you the users or consumers allowed to do uh, questions so far on the general proposal nope okay cool so next slide then uh how would the usage pattern would look like so uh, for this given example if you have an api export uh, which restricts just get verbs um, on secrets uh, if a user tries to access, you know, a secret on, on a workspace where the user declared a binding towards sheriffs, a get will work, but a post will fail, right? So uh, in this case, restrict two constraints to get verbs on secrets for consumers of API bindings. Obviously, what you see in here, when we just leave it as is, we have a potential problem, namely we lock the access to all secrets for consumers in all of its namespaces inside the consumer's workspace. So here comes another twist in the proposal. We need a little bit more, namely, um, you know, yeah, this is the example if, if the user tries to access another secret bar uh, instead of a full secret um, due to the verb list here in the permission claim um, access will be forbidden. Um, so we need a little bit more, and therefore the proposal is to add one more field into the permission claims, namely the resource name that you're trying to restrict access to. Um, in this case, obviously, if the user tries to update the other secret bar, uh, since the claim only refers to a resource name foo of secrets, obviously, with the canonical um, you know, syntax that we know from Kubernetes, namespace slash resource name, um, the consumer of the API can still edit other secrets in other namespaces. Andy. Uh, yeah, did you, I'm curious if you considered making the resource name uh, an array and taking in possibly multiple names and or selectors? I don't know what the cost would be to implement that uh, off the top of my head, but I could imagine it would be useful yeah totally i mean that's that's a good proposal i mean i just you know um shoot it for the resource name being enough potentially having redundant permission claim entries but that sounds like a good idea yeah 
So we are we are also pretty free in performance. Uh, so everything is controller and emission based. So the, the mechanism we have today. So everything we can map to labels, uh, which are per, per permission claim we can implement. So label selectors, as you say, um, JSON pass based things mm. relative to other objects. So be creative. You have to find use cases and implement solutions for them. Thanks. Um, Steve, uh, or I believe. Uh, Mike Spritzer was first. I don't. I don't remember. Mike, you go first. See if you go next. Yeah, I, actually, I don't quite understand the problem. Back on slide four, you said something about locking. Um, since I assume what you mean here is that these permission claims get added to the RBAC, and RBAC is additive. All we're saying is that you have failed to give permission to the uh, consumer to read other secrets, which is exactly your intent. Um, I, will, I will come to the deadlock uh, in a minute. Um, the thing is, I think what you believe is, uh, what you are speaking about is about the ORBEC within workspaces, right? The regular Kubernetes ORBEC. Yeah, I assume, I, you didn't actually say yeah. it, but maybe you should just check my assumption. I was assuming yeah. that these permission claims get uh, added uh, by either explicitly or implicitly to the uh, regular RBAC in the consumer workspace. Yes, so they are additive, obviously. That like we don't translate it to real roles or cluster roles. Like, oh, so to answer your question, yes, we could solve this on a pure RBAC level per workspace. Um, the thing is, why we are doing it on an API export level is that you know we would have to update potentially millions of workspaces with RBAC definitions to reflect what we um declared in the api api export right so like that would be an extremely expensive operation when it comes to the implementation what will rather happen is like there will be a concrete authorizer like literally an authorizer inside the existing authorizer chain in kcp that will you know assert um you know the user is accessing a workspace um, does it access a resource which has an API binding? Does the API binding have any permission claim restrictions set? If so, you know, check if the request well, let me is stop out. you right there, right? So the authorizer chain also is additive, right? An authorizer can say yes, no, or pass. And you just said an interesting word, right? You introduced this as additive, but then you just said restriction. So this is my kind of my That's confusion. It. Mike, it's it's a chain. It's def, it's not a union. So union, what you are mm. talking about is, is a union. A chain mm -hmm. is really um, one by one. If one fails, it's it's gone. It's over. Well, no. It, it, if I recall correctly, the authorizer chain is indeed one by one. But each one can oh, say right. yes, allowed, forbidden, or pass. It can say no the decision. Norm also, yeah, the normal authorizer is like the external ones. You can mm. additionally configure. They are like that. But this is different. It's it's um, a conjunction between both. Yes. It's not the union. And sorry for picking the wrong word. That's the fate of a non-native speaker. Yeah. But you're you're right. Yeah. And in this case, you know, as soon as that uh, authorizer uh, you know and sees this violation, it will sort of like say deny, right? And it will not pass. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm just grossly confused because in regular Kubernetes. Um, there is a chain of authorizers that can say allow, deny, or no decision. And the convention is that each one either actually says allow or no decision. And so it in practice becomes a union. And yeah, it was telling, the, name, the, the, yeah. the term chain is not well chosen in Cube, if this is used. maybe. It <laughs> well, is. It's, it, is, it is well chosen that says <laughs> that these things are examined one by one in order. But you're right. This is this is not the union authorizer that we know from the Kubernetes implementation. That's absolutely true, right? So, like this. So you're um, telling me that in KCP the framework was different. It's yes. every member uh -huh. has to say uh -huh. allow. Is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, no. This particular thing are are unique, right? Like this, it's impossible to implement this feature with that semantic from Kube. We already have similar cases. So I, I think yeah. it's a doc. We don't have to go into details here. Um, there are already a couple of authorizers which are changed, but in the conjunctive way, um, like access to the workspace is one of them. <laughs> and this is already the case. Could even be done in Cube. It's just not exposed. In code, you can do that in Cube as well. And critically, too, like if you, you know, this 
also fundamentally can't be implemented through like delegated RBAC objects as well, because if you have admin to the workspace, you can do whatever you want. And that is expressly not what this is about. Um, I guess, uh, Serge, I just I linked an issue in the chat. We have one open for like different types of selector behaviors. So I think if we just you know leave it open for other things in the future, that'd be great. But resource name is a great place to start. Yeah, I would say so as well. Um, Mike, I hope that answers uh, your question. We can also um, continue the discussion offline uh, on Slack as well. Let, let me see, just right. summarize. I think what I heard actually is that the desired semantics of this, it's not about it. there's a different framework in KCP, but this particular authorizer semantically needs to be able to say denied because it is indeed intended to impose restrictions. Yes. Those are upper bounds. That's a Thank different you. term I, I like to yeah. use. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Um, any any more questions? All right. Uh, if not, I would continue. The next side of things um, is on the service provider side. So obviously, service providers uh, access um, things using the so-called virtual API export API server. Um, dear maintainers, we need a, some shortcut for this thing. <laughs> uh, I think it needs some abbreviation. Um, anyways, uh, what you usually do here is there is this concept of virtual API service. And um, when you access service <laughs> via us, oh god, <laughs> yeah, API server VW, yeah, that's, that's also fine. Um, with the slash services slash API export uh, prefix on um, requests and um, this is the canonical way of service providers to access um, you know concrete resources and workspaces that are being exported so and this is exactly the place where the claim set of verbs um, starts to function right in this case if the service provider accesses uh, the very same secret by the virtual API server um, the virtual API export API server it has permissions to um, execute all verbs, so access will be permitted. Um, we have a problem, though. Uh, imagine in the very same consumer workspace, we have another API binding. Cowboys, also a term taken from E2E -E test. Sorry about that. I'm not very creative here. Uh, and that API binding, that Cowboys API binding, uh, also has a permission claim towards secrets. And it restricts, uh, for instance, uh, to get operations. So these needs to be considered also in this case, even if the service provider claimed, um, oh yeah, thanks Stefan, claimed uh, all permissions on the Sheriff's API export, right? So uh, we have to take care in the authorizer um, that also verbs that are being present in restrict two are being applied uh, from other potential API bindings in the same from, um, consumer workspace when they are originating from different API exports. So um, that's, the, that's the problem. Obviously, we have sort of like a deadlock situation here. And the solution here, again, resource name, using selectors or whatnot, right, to uh, restrict uh, in the API export um, exactly the set of resources that you, know, you want to uh, have permission claims for. And this is also sort of like the realization that we are having. Um, when it comes to permission claims, the goal here will be to be as explicit as possible, especially when it comes to claiming permissions on cube native resources, because it's easy to lock out or to deadlock sort of like other service providers whenever you have different bindings in your consumer workspace. Um, so we have another case that we have to consider, and that's actually KCP bind. So I took this. Um, slide from Stefan's presentation. That is sort of like a new mechanism that we want to introduce um, in order to be able to synchronize resources inside workspaces to literally native Kubernetes clusters, right? Like your favorite Kubernetes distribution may be a kind uh, Minikube or OpenShift cluster. And we have another problem here that in in this dimension, we don't have in KCP API exports and API bindings. And that is 
um, we have synced resources on the native cube cluster. And in this case, you know, this foo resource is the example here, which is a claimed resource in the API export. In this case, the API export is called MangoDB. I should have called it sheriffs here as well and secrets to be consistent with the previous slides. And the question here is, what is the canonical source of truth for writing to foo, right? You can, um, using um, the things that I explained previously, you can perfectly say, I claim star on foo, but also, you know, restrict to star for consumers of the API on foo. And then it becomes a problem for the syncing mechanism because Bo, if you write an API export like this, I think I gave, yeah, I, I think I gave this example here. If you write an API export like this, you know, we have a conflict because the syncer then doesn't know what do I do? It needs to do some sort of a cancellation and it doesn't know what to do when somebody on the left-hand side, uh, the red foo, uh, change that resource or uh, the service provider change that resource. Again, um, a pretty simple solution that we are envisioning here is we want to have um, an opinionated set of verbs that we know are mutating resources. Um, and those can either be only claimed or restricted to mutually exclusive, right? So you cannot say, both you know um update in the claim and in the restrict to set of verbs these lists must be mutually exclusive obviously um, read operations can be declared on both sides of things and this invariant at least that's sort of like the idea will be checked in the api export admission such that you know you cannot even create an api export if writing verbs are conflicting um, so 15 slides, 20 minutes, I'm, I'm good also uh, time-wise. Any more questions towards this proposal? All right, so going once, twice. I will update, there is a, an existing PR um, for this proposal here. So I will update, it's, it's not 100% up to date yet with what I just presented here, but I will, update it and uh, yeah welcome the community to discuss further details over there obviously also mike um inviting you as well there and then we can continue the discussion that's it from my side thank you thanks Serge. uh and i want to call out as well that um sort of that object selection mechanism that we talked about uh we would like to hear from folks about how they want to select objects we had some you know, straw man ideas, all objects that I've ever created, you know, all secrets referenced in a pod spec volume mount, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what kind of selectors are useful. Um, so some feedback that would be awesome. Maybe just uh, one one thing, one question. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Jason Path uh, was mentioned at some point, uh, you know, on the various uh, options in this area. And I was wondering, um, did we envision the case where we want um, a service provider or some sort of controller, I'm thinking mainly of the upcoming coordination controllers, to be able to only change some things or to, uh, in the in a given objects, for example, um, to be able to modify only some labels uh, that that are forbidden for other type of of controllers which are less privileged in, in some sense, uh, and the contrary also. So I mean, is it something that is covered by more or less the 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 proposal or something that should be added? Uh, that, that's it for my question. Serge, you got your hand. Um, yeah, Andy, I'm, I'm curious what what your opinion on this one is. I've been briefly discussing this with Stefan as well. The idea, like there are two things. First, there is a proposal upstream to allow fine-grained permissions on field levels. However, this is not in Kubernetes yet, right? So I'm not sure if it's a good idea to uh, rely on this idea. Second thing is, or second strawman proposal is to have dedicated verbs, dedicated mutation verbs like annotate or label or something like this that reflect sort of like this fine-grained uh, mm. set of permissions. Andy? I do think that we are going to need to at least have annotations or labels that are protected. So um, there's an issue, I don't have the number in front of me, 
for finding some way to um, restrict. I mean, it's kind of like reverse permission claims where um, we, I guess, yeah, I guess it's all tied up into this. Like there's um, say like a resource quota that the API provider needs to be able to create and maintain. Um, so that's, that's the full reverse permission claim bit. Um, but I think that there's probably other examples where there are labels or annotations that a service provider wants to own and not allow users to change, but they don't care if the user and they're they're happy to let the user change other contents. Yeah, this one. Thanks. Yeah. And as as to whether or not something like Kubernetes API machinery already supports this, and should we avoid it because they don't? I think that um, we should look at what's been discussed previously. And if there are significant concerns in terms of performance or whatnot, we should um, definitely take those into consideration. If it's just hasn't been implemented yet, I don't think there's any reason we couldn't work to both try and get this upstream and also do it in KCP simultaneously. I think this fits very well in this in this model that uh, Sergei showed. Um, Sergei also showed this example where there's mutual, mutual um, access, like you cannot have two two writers to an object. And in the to your example, I think this is pretty much what you are saying. You want write access to certain labels, and at the same time forbid write access to other people, like to the users. So I think it fits perfectly well. It's just a question how to express that in a nice API. So you probably give some prefix or some domain in labels or something and say, these are mine and nobody else can touch them. Yeah, and maybe a, a first step would be, since there, there there is already some protection for, you know, uh, internal annotations, uh, for example, or, or privilege levels. So maybe at least the first step where you, you have a verb to be able to modify privilege levels uh, that, you know, normal clients and, and, and users cannot modify maybe no i don't I, I don't think pri privilege is privileged there is no way around that hmm. you must be cluster admin not cluster admin but you must system must be a system master to, to skip the authorization chain basically so yeah, we cannot well, open them up if this is a requirement of somebody we have to talk we will uh, never um, open them up yeah or maybe it could be a, a distinct uh, category of of annotations, but at least some annotations. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to move them out into something where users can access them. Hmm. Okay, David. Let's make sure that what you're thinking about is captured in that um, that issue. I linked it in the chat. Yes, I I assume yes. At least it, it's it would be a, a starting point. I think. Cool. Awesome. Uh, unless we have something else, uh, Paolo, looks like you're here to talk about edge workload distribution. Uh, yes, um, thank you. So first, a uh, brief introduction. I'm Paolo De Tori from IBM Research. I've been working on several Kubernetes projects at IBM. Also work a little bit with the cross-plane community. I'm happy to see Daniel here, by the way. Hi. <laughs> um, so I, Today, uh, we had a um, discussion a few days ago with uh, David Pestel and Stefan um, about some of these um, edge use cases. So I wanted to take a little time just to talk about uh, maybe outlining some of these use cases and some of the difference that we see uh, between um, the current model with TNC and what we may need to actually deal with uh, edge deployment. So the first use case I want to outline is a retail use case. So in this case, we have uh, potentially hundreds of stores uh, for a retail chain, and we have an app that needs to be deployed from a central location to all these stores. And we need also to customize um, each rental store location uh, with particular parameters, name properties, and values that can be specific to the location. And potentially, the store manager has some autonomy also in defining properties there. Um, one of the differences that we see in a normal multi-cluster is that um, uh, each store may need to operate with uh, a reliable 
potential unreliable network. So you may have loss of connectivity, even for extended period of time. You may have also low bandwidth. Um, and the idea is that the application at the store needs to continue to operate, even if you lose the connectivity to the center. Uh, another use case that we have, again, I'm going to go very high level, uh, and then uh, this is the idea is to sort of talk about where we see the difference with the TNC here, uh, is the industrial edge use case, where uh, essentially it's a AI ML kind of um, use case where we have uh, ML training in the center, uh, and then inferencing that happens uh, the manufacturing plant. And the, the, the goal here is to deliver an application that does inferencing to the plants. And there could be also, of course, a model. There is an application, there is a model that needs to be delivered. In this case, the scale typically is about tens of manufacturing plants. Uh, in each plant, I may have uh, sensors in the production line uh, that are connected to some line server. And then from there, they can be connected to some, potentially to a cluster. Uh, so it could be a Kubernetes cluster in some case that we, we see this trend emerging of having small cluster like K3S, uh, potentially MicroShift, et cetera, coming up and running the inferencing there. So we essentially need to deliver this inferencing up from the center to all these different locations. Um, there is also, in this case, a plan manager that could make decisions and maybe somehow uh, customize the app. Um, this can be done from the center. Or there could be some local decision. And then, of course, we we'll finally define roles, but they're not going to get too much in detail there. Um, so re requirements are similar probably to retail, uh, but there is also the need to manage some of the, the machine learning model lifecycle. And the last use case I want to quickly outline is a telco uh, use case. Um, here, the, the idea is that um, telcos today uh, they are using SDN to manage 5G networks using, using virtualized uh, radio access network of VRANs. Uh, in this case, there are different components connected to the uh, 5G antennas. And in some of these components, for example, distributed units on the central centralized units, um, some uh, telco are actually starting to experiment with Kubernetes, low footprint Kubernetes, maybe single node kind of Kubernetes deployment, and uh, deploy some of these network functions with customizations uh, there uh, at the edge in this in these kind of locations. Uh, so if, even in this case, we have a need to customize sometimes per location. Uh, we have also this natural hierarchy uh, because we have all this uh, hierarchy of different units and eventually going back to the center where we need to somehow control and distribute uh, network functions. Um, the main difference with the other two cases is the scale. It is much larger. We're talking about potentially 1,000 uh, towers, for example, uh, per region, and there are multiple regions, etc. So this is probably the main difference. Now, uh, given that uh, brief introduction on uh, these cases, we like to sort of, we, we actually been playing a little bit with KCP. We think actually it's a very nice model for delivering uh, workloads, uh, even to the edge. But of course, uh, where we start experimenting, we saw that there are difference in the way actually TMC works and the kind of features that uh, will be required to, to deal with uh, this kind of edge multi-cluster scenarios. So the first uh, similarity with, uh, with the TMC, uh, we think, is that uh, in the TMC model, a user can create a workspace, it can create, for example, a placement policy to bind namespaces to locations and then apply uh, this uh, workload to the namespace and the syncer will deliver this workload to, to the target. So from this perspective, we, we think this model is very attractive, this user experience, uh, because in a way it makes somehow this idea that you have this uh, somehow virtual cluster from where you can deploy now workload to different uh, locations. And we'd like to have a similar model in a way for uh, the edge multi-cluster, the ENC. But there are, of course, differences uh, that we like to compare and contrast, right? So in the case of TNC, uh, what happens is that one application is delivered exactly to one target cluster. Um, so we could achieve a behavior. Per placement. Per placement object. Yeah, per placement, yes. Uh, so we can actually achieve the behavior today in TNC defining a 
a placement and defining allocation for each of the sync targets, and that is actually possible today. Um, but of course, you have to start creating all these different uh, resources, and there are also other differences that I'm, I'm going to outline. For example, in ENC, ideally, we like to have one single policy, one single way to define a predicate, uh, to identify many clusters and get the application delivered to all of them. Uh, so it's more like a one-to-n kind of model to deliver. Um, and TNC, uh, the other difference, uh, as we saw some of these use cases, we could have network partitions, right? And in, uh, in the current TNC model, there is a health checking. Uh, so if, uh, for uh, example, a cluster goes down, uh, the TNC scheduler will reschedule the workload to a different cluster. Uh, ENC, on the other end, we probably need to have a different approach to health checking. We need to be tolerant somehow to um, loss of connectivity for an extended period of time. Um, another difference, we think, in the current model with the sinker, when uh, a deployment a pod is actually delivered to a target, uh, the pod is uh, somehow injecting some basically environment variables and certificates. The pods points back to KCP, right? So that's a behavior probably needs to be somehow customizable in a way for these scenarios because we don't want to have the pod depends again on the KCP on the center because those locations they have to operate in autonomy. As we said, autonomy is one of the features of uh, edge somehow compared to the TMC. And finally, the last part is more about scale, right? We, we potentially could have a large number of uh, sync targets. And today I think uh, this, uh, TNC is more looking at maybe a handful of clusters from what we understand, but of course we have to look how we can extend it to maybe potentially hundreds or maybe even in the future thousands. Um, and the last point is um, about status, right? Once we start going into this model of one to N, uh, now we have to figure out a way to somehow um, get the status for all the different copies from the targets and potentially aggregate and summarize the status. So in one place that is somehow easy to see what is going on. And then from there, maybe be able to drill down and see if there is any problem. Uh, to the individual status. So anyway, this was just a brief intro uh, to explain, you know, the use case that we saw and some of the difference that we see with TNC. I think Mike has also some more points um, on, you know, things, initial thinking that we have in this space. But I'd like first to hear if there is any thought about uh, this, anything that anyone would like to, to bring up here. Okay, so Mike, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit more about some initial thoughts in this space. Yeah, so I've been working on a proposed L4 interface, uh, what uh, users of the edge scenarios would uh, might be doing. Um, and then I was hoping to engage some discussion about implementation, uh, since it does have overlap with the uh, TMC use case. You know, the thinking is um, we can probably uh, share some implementation technology. Let me try to share my screen here. Where do I find that? Oh, geez. There it is. Okay, I'm just going to share the whole screen. Um, yeah, share. And it's not liking it now. Oh, now it's liking it. Okay. So for the people who are not aware, so transparent multi-clusters, when you say it, is it a separate project we use KCP or to, to what we use? It's the term here? that we use to talk about like the functionality that's provided by the syncer. It's not strictly required uh, for KCP. KCP can be a control plane without it, but right now they're yeah. bundled together. OK, gotcha. OK. So um, I've hypothesized uh, an interface. Um, let me start. Uh, so one of the problems that, that uh, I think is important in Edge is uh, the users, or uh, it's, it's actually, uh, I think needs to be emphasized a little bit more than what Paulo said is, it's not just DevOps. It's a much more fine grained division of roles and responsibilities. One of the things that people involved need to be able to do is bundle things and create and reuse abstractions. Um, and uh, my proposal is let's not, we don't need to invent anything. Uh, that's already been solved a few times. One solution is Helm. Um, and uh, GitOps also provides bundling, uh, not quite so great on abstraction. Um, 
And so I propose uh, that we should go back to creating an API for Helm, uh, but that's, that's purely non-Edge uh, or, or TMC. Uh, that's purely a Helm development. Um, getting on to the Edge part, I proposed an alternate uh, placement that has a spec that is similar to uh, TMCs. It's got select location selectors and namespace selectors. But as Paolo said, the semantic is don't pick one of the matching locations, pick all of them. This, this is saying I want the, um, the contents of these namespaces delivered to all of the matching locations. And then once we get to multiple destinations, that raises the question of coordination of rolling out changes. Um, you know, the simplest thing you could imagine is that every change gets rolled out AS as quickly as possible, but that's not actually what you always want, right? And in fact, you know, concepts like canary testing or blue-green testing uh, are exactly about uh, controlling the rollout. Uh, also, uh, when you get into, for example, telcos, where they have overlapping coverage by different antennas, uh, you have a kind of uh, domain-specific control you want to exert over a rollout there as well. So I have hypothesized that in this kind of edge placement, there is a option to specify some control over rollout, um, which I have hypothesized a simple uh, way of doing that, uh, which is in terms of putting a lower bound on the uh, number of uh, destinations that have got the latest copy. That lower bound could be specified either in absolute terms or as a percentage. Um, and then the next challenge is status. Uh, status looks, uh, again, a little bit different when you're trying to talk about a uh, placement going to all matching locations. Um, one of the things uh, in the uh, TMC placement is as soon as there is some binding, uh, it goes into uh, immutable. Um, and I, I think for edge, we don't want placement to shift into immutable. Uh, there's an inherent dynamicity in the set of matching uh, locations. Uh, so it, it doesn't make sense to think of placement as uh, immutable. Um, this status needs this to reflect a uh, spec generation. Uh, and then I've hypothesized again some simple things here, uh, a count of the matching locations, and then a status from the rollout. Uh, and rollout status, again, I've just started with a really simple status, uh, which is a count of the number of completely current um, the number that are not completely current and uh, stale. As Paolo mentioned, uh, disconnected uh, or lack of connectivity is normal, um, but we do want to have some kind of a concept of uh, this thing has been disconnected for so long that we're going to consider the information from it stale, not necessarily a fatal error, but maybe something for a little bit of attention. Um, so that's placement. And then uh, together with something that goes together with that is customization. I've hypothesized a few different ways of doing customization. Um, one is, uh, and let me maybe get to some examples here. Yeah, let me, let me just actually try showing some examples. Um, okay. Um, here we go. So an example with customization. Um, and let's take um, this here. Uh, let's see uh, this one here. So the idea here is to be able to say, oops, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, let's see, uh, here we go. No, it's not that one. Uh, the source, uh, good grief, did I lose the, Example, oh, okay, um, okay, uh, no, I've got it here somewhere, where, do, um, so, oh, uh, geez, just, just a moment, I'm sorry, um, okay, I'll, I'll just go up here and actually look at it, um, so here is an example of a, uh, a Helm uh, interface object that is uh, doing customization in the simplest possible way. Uh, it's enabled by an annotation. 
that says uh, to do what I call parameter expansion, which is when you see this syntax percent and then in parentheses a parameter name, what that means is that this is a reference to an edge uh, property and in each uh, location uh, that obviously that parameter reference gets replaced by the parameter value. Uh, the parameter values would come from the labels and annotations of the, the location. So the idea is that you could put in here uh, any label or annotation key. So that would be a simple way of uh, going about that. Hey, Mike, uh, Mike well, yes. one, one point. <laughs> I don't yep. know if we need to go too much in detail. I think uh, our idea here was also to start uh, you know, presenting the use case, some of the initial thoughts, and also potentially opening the floor to see uh, what is um, the best way to somehow proceed if we want to Maybe these are some initial idea, but maybe there is some way to somehow bring this maybe into an issue or some discussion within the community that uh, we like to maybe start small and see what are the things that make sense to 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 to, to start tackling without getting you know this level of detail yet. So I'd like to hear maybe from the folks here if there's any thoughts what would be the best way to bring some of these uh, thoughts. Um, maybe as an issue or maybe some google docs or what would be the best way all right i'll just briefly point out i also have a proposal for uh status summarization um but yes let's uh, see what people think about how to proceed see david as a present um yes stefan raised the end before maybe he can start yeah, so uh, it's pretty exciting to see that. That uh, so we talked about it before. That maybe a different API is really the way to go for that. And I'm really, I really like to see that. Um, I'm very interested in. So one bigger question for KCP as a project, and especially the core of KCP, is our task and challenge is to make this work possible on top of KCP without your service being in any way privileged. We had similar discussions, so David and I discussed that. Um, TMC started as part of core, and we always tried to keep it kind of not too much in the in the core parts, but it still is at some point. point and um, we also want to, to move out K, um, TMC from KCP to make it its own self-standing side project, mm -hmm. sub-project of KCP. And the same challenge we have here, and I think they are they're really overlap. So our challenge in work in the community is to make or to enable KCP to to host such a thing like this edge-based workload API. I, I think I see two challenges. Well, one is, as you said, I think KCP uh, today has a factoring problem. TMC needs to be uh, separated out. That's what um, I'm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm saying more than that. I'm saying that the edge case has enough overlap with TMC that I'm hoping that rather than TMC and Edge being completely independent things built on top of the lower layer, that yeah. they may be able to share some technology. So that, that was my, my point. I mean, the point I wanted to bring just after. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, the fact that um, there uh, for the TMC, when we started on that, um, along the way, there uh, we we meet the need to build some primitives that are you know the basis for concrete TMC work. Uh, one of those primitives, for example, is the <coughs> obviously the sinker. But if we go a, a bit more into the detail, the sinker virtual workspace, which it which is still being completed. I mean, with interesting features that could be of interest for you. But th these are two components here the sinker which is an adjunct in the physical cluster but then you have the sinker virtual workspace which is mainly um, a primitive on the kcp side to present all the resources uh, in which the sinker uh, and finally the physical cluster will be interested in all the resources that have to be synced and this is typically the type of uh, primitives that it seems to me would be could be at least if we design them correctly could be shared between various um, variants of multi-cluster, you know, transparent one, edge one. But typically, the, this type of things give me all the objects which are uh, we are interested in. A common way to transform those objects 
according to the target where they will be synced. For example, this is also something that you are interested in and that we could have and would have if there is an open peer for that, uh, you know, ongoing peer. Um, th these type of things could be common. And then we have to, it seems to me, think together with all the, var with the new use cases that, that come up, the new type of multi-cluster. We have to think together how we draw the lines uh, between what would be different and sort of pluggable, like the, the sinker, you can even today just replace the sinker with another image. So there are things, parts which are pluggable and others which would be common primitives and that we have to design with this approach in mind, it seems to me. And it seems to me that the difference between the sinker agent on the physical cluster side and the sinker virtual workspace inside KCP is quite a good example of those two types of, of uh, components. But does it make sense um, related to your question, Mike? Yes, right. Uh, I think, yes, there's, there's uh, a matter of designing the interface, right? And identifying what makes sense to be shared and, and not. So I, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had here, right? We've just kind of started to open the topic. So, yeah. and the meeting's almost over now. So I think, uh, you know, my question really is, is how do we want to proceed to make progress on this topic or these topics? Andy, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I would say in terms of proceeding, I think we should, uh, or if you all could put together one or more proposals for, and just at a high level, like what sort of um, factoring would you like to see for? I mean, sorry, Andy. I, I what we've got so far is I have proposals for interface. I really wanted discussion and I wanted to hear your guys' ideas about what makes sense as common implementation. Um, so I, I just I'm just gonna stop and say, you know, it seems like we have similar scheduling and sinker problems, but not identical. So, you know, I, I wanted to solicit ideas about what makes sense there. Yeah, so to finish my statement, I think that if you can put together proposals for where you see commonality between edge and TMC and where you see divergence, then we can take a look at that and provide feedback and continue to discuss where it makes sense for KCP slash TMC to have shared functionality and then where the, the edge stuff could be something that uh, you and, and other folks who are interested in edge can continue to explore standalone. What would be the right form for doing that? Are we talking about issues in GitHub or are we talking about docs that just gets shared around or what? I would be fine with anything. Like it could be a drawing that just, you know, has like TMC on the left, edge on the right and common in the middle. And you just list out what you think um, fits in each bucket. Like it, it could be a Google doc. Um, anything makes sense i would say and, and i'm not looking for like 20 pages of prose or anything just high level topics yeah i i my my problem is it sounds like you're asking for something that's a little more uh worked out uh you know as i as i've been saying um i think i i you know i'm what i'm trying to work out is some interface that makes sense from a user experience point of view um and i'm um the implementation is is really kind of a an open space in my mind um i think the current interface between the sinker and the scheduler is not going to scale um so i think you know just briefly you know we need to talk about a scalable interface between a scheduler and sinker and you know uh there's some commonality again and some I, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself I've, I've run out of as far as i've thought about uh, implementation yeah mike i think um i guess maybe what Andy was trying to say like this sounds good um it sounds like a good direction it sounds like there's a lot of overlap um i think let's take time maybe david can find time yeah. to chat and like sure. the, the next step could be collaborative not as much like please you go off and <laughs> create another document 
Sure, and, and well, I I'm happy to, to share. Sorry. I would like to share what I've done so far on proposing uh, interface because I think that will really flesh out a little bit better the uh, the you know the thoughts about where we need to go for implementation. Totally. Um, I, I was about just sorry. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I, I was about just to suggest maybe to uh, in addition to such a Google Doc where you know remaining high level parts where we are still seeking for similarities. I think it's quite an important one, but maybe uh, there are some precise things that we already know uh, have to be investigated. For example, the network, uh, you know, independency. So that's clearly something that we have to think about. That I mean, to me, it's something where we can already open a GitHub issue. Um, how do we manage cases where um, the sync targets, we know they are going to be deconnected regularly. So that's because that's even something that we have to think more generally. Um, another point like that uh, is, you know, uh, the fact that in some cases we don't want the workloads to point back to KCP, for example. That's also related to to the same thing. So these things, which are really infrastructure underlying infrastructure difference, you know, that break the current assumptions of KCP. It seems to me that we can already create issues and start discussing with on that, and then keep the Google document for, you know, trying to find additional. Uh, convergence areas. Does it make sense? Totally. Uh, David, do you want to uh, find a time next week and schedule for the community to chat about this? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, in a dedicated meeting, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, we have one minute, and I have a very quick topic that I just want to blurt out here um, before we go. So we, uh, and I, by we, I mean Andy and I right now, are uh, currently in the process of uh, moving around some of our testing in the KCP repo. So um, uh, one, of the <clears throat> one of the things we've noticed uh, is generally uh, we have some tests that are using fake client sets. Um, we want to move away from that to using sort of the mocking function-based stuff that we have everywhere else. There's a small list here. Um, I think we've found that the, the little functions are a little bit more robust. Uh, they make for shorter tests that are a little bit easier to write. And they don't have some of the same setup properties where your test has to like create indexers correctly and all that sort of stuff. So um, just keep an eye on this. Uh, if you're writing new tests now using fake clients, uh, reach out. Um, let's chat, figure out a different way for you to, to go forward. Um, otherwise, just quick FYI on that one. Um, awesome. I'll just ask. I don't you know, know any details of what you're saying. But you know, from my work upstream in Kubernetes, I'm going to complain that there's a lot of tests that are really check subtests for every function in implementation. You write a test function that says, is the implementation function doing what I thought it does? And there's a different style of test, which is you know a behavior test. Is, does this thing accomplish what it should without regarding the implementation? Um, and mocking sounds more like the former than the latter, and fake clients sound more like the latter than the former. Totally. Uh, and I think the. Maybe I'm being imprecise in my language. I think we are looking at the the latter sort of test. Um, I think there's a bunch of setting up the fake clients, making sure that your informer factory is set up the same way that the informer factory would have otherwise been set up when starting the controller, waiting for the caches to sync in the same way, like that sort of stuff, uh, ends up making those tests a little fragile. And that might be a KCP specific thing, um, but it's definitely something we've noticed. So uh, I, the intent is not to do the checksum sort of thing, like you were saying. Great, thank you. Yep. Awesome. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone, for all the discussions. And uh, let's keep an eye out for that follow-up meeting, David, about the edge. Thanks, all. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks.